Thank you, ladies. That was good. All right, if you have your Bible, turn to the book of Matthew with me tonight, please. Chapter number 1, verse 18. <coughs> Matthew chapter number 1 and verse 18. This is Levi the publican. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, now he quotes Isaiah chapter number 7, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not, till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Yeah. Father, I pray that you'd add your blessing and unction, the anointing, to your holy word as it goes forth. Thy name we pray. Amen. Just a little bit of a background of what's happening here in Matthew. If you look at Matthew chapter number 1 and verse 1, it says, The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, if you'll notice, uh, folks, David lived about 1,000 years before Christ. Abraham lived 900 years before David. Abraham lived 1,900 years before Christ. And yet in the genealogy, David is listed before Abraham. Reason for that is this is a royal genealogy. And therefore, it is the dynasty that's at issue. And the dynasty is of the house of David. It is the Davidic throne. It is the sure mercies of David. Therefore, the kingdom as the king is being born into the kingdom, being born qualified to reign over the kingdom, then is the kingdom of David, the house of David. Now what you find in chapter number 2 of the book of Matthew, in verse number 1, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king. This king is a Idumean. Herod the so-called great is an Idumean which means he's only a partial Jew at best. He is of the house of Edom, which is the house of Esau. Now, if you know your Old Testament history, you'll know that Esau is the one who sold his birthright for a bowl of pottage. Therefore, he despised the birthright of the Lord. Now, being this, since this is, since this is the case, and it certainly is, what we have here is a man wanting to sit on the throne of David who is completely, totally unqualified to sit on the throne of David, for he is not of the house of David. The true king of Israel has been born, and his name is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the true king of Israel, because he is born of the house of David. Now the writer of Matthew here, when he writes this, he wants you to understand, this is very important. A virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son. Da uh, Matthew quotes Isaiah chapter number 7 and verse number 14 and says that the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, the son of David, qualified to sit on the throne of Israel in the, tri as the, as the, uh, in the dynasty of David, is virgin born. So therefore he has no earthly father. So therefore the genealogy, his, his, uh, his credentials that qualify him to sit on the throne of David must come through his mother and not through his father. And of course they do, because Mary is of the house of David, qualified on both sides to be a, to be a king over Israel. 
If Joseph adopts Christ, he is also of the house of David. So we get a double here on either side. The Lord Jesus Christ is qualified to sit on the throne of Israel. But Matthew does not mince words. He tells you two times here in chapter number 1 that her pregnancy is of the Holy Ghost. He tells you plainly that the virgin birth, she is impregnated by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. That's important, folks, because we have arrogant, condescending, liberal people who think they are Christians that deny the virgin birth. They are no more a Christian than Satan's a Christian. They don't have a clue. If you deny the virgin birth, you've denied the full, complete foundation of what the atonement is about. The Lord Jesus Christ had to be qualified to go to the cross and shed His precious blood for you to be saved. And that blood could not be tainted by the original curse of Adam. And, and, and so therefore His blood, Acts chapter number 20, verse number 28, is the blood of God. God's got blood. And so where does God get His blood? He gets it in the incarnation. When God became a man, the Lord Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh. 1 Timothy 3, verse number 16. And hath washed us from our sins in His own blood. Yes. Revelation 1, 5. So you are not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. The blood of Christ is precious indeed. This is important, folks. It's very important. To lay the foundation for anything that follows. If you deny the virgin birth, you are not a Christian. Oh, you may agree with some of the moral precepts. You may be like some of the founding fathers who were Unitarians. You may, you may believe, uh, you know, some high sounding uh, 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 things about the life of Christ and the great moral precepts that he taught us and blah, blah, blah. But the bottom line is, the Lord Jesus Christ is God of very God walking in flesh on this earth. Anything less is a denial of Scripture. So we have two people involved in the virgin birth. Two people. Not one, but two. And you say, well, how could this be? Well, you've got Joseph. And if you'll notice, the Bible says he was a just man. And when he found out that she was pregnant, he did what he... He chose to do what a, what a man would do who has a soft, compassionate, loving heart. Instead of taking her before the council and having her stoned to death, which he could have because they were espoused, he chose to put her away privately. Now when God chooses folks, he makes no mistake in the choice. God not only chose Mary, he chose Joseph too. Because it took both of them. It took Joseph to be able to agree with Mary and agree with God that this pregnancy was of God. There was no precedent for it in the Bible. Joseph could not pick up the Old Testament and read one verse of Scripture for, for where anybody beforehand had ever become pregnant of the Holy Ghost. So he had to believe God, and he did believe Him. According to what you read in the book of Matthew chapter number 1, there wasn't any vacillation. He didn't hem haw around about it. Okay, if this is what you say, Lord, all right, I accept this. And he accepted this virgin birth. Now, of course, that was Joseph's purpose in this world. He was to be the... Uh, what would you what would you call a stepfather to Christ to be there in the home to for him to grow up and to be a male uh, a male a man in the house to uh, for Christ to have an, to have a, a a stepfather to grow up around he had a mother and he had a father but you understand when I say father the Holy Spirit never never the Holy Spirit never you need to get make that indelible impression in your soul. The Holy Spirit never refers to Joseph as the father of Christ. Never. Some of the new Bibles do. His mother and his father, they say. Joseph was not the father of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit never calls Joseph the father of Christ. And of course, then if Joseph wasn't his father, who was his father? The Almighty. That's who his father was. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye Him. So in Matthew chapter number 1, the foundation is laid for the, for the Christian faith. And if you try to circumvent that and run off from different directions, you're going to get in trouble big time. Because every writer in the New Testament supports the doctrine that Jesus Christ is God in flesh and that the birth was a virgin birth. Now they'd like to run back to Matthew, Isaiah chapter number 7. 
and, and go into the Hebrew words and try to stretch a little bit here and scratch around a little bit there and try to tell you that the prophecy of Isaiah chapter number 7 verse 14 was fulfilled during the lifetime of Isaiah. Now let me tell you something about that. There might have been a, a temporal application to somebody alive at the time of Isaiah, but the fulfillment of that prophecy was not complete until the Lord Jesus Christ was born. You say, how do you know that? Matthew quoted it. Now you're either going to believe Matthew or you're not. If you're going to believe Matthew, if you're not going to believe Matthew on the virgin birth, throw the rest of Matthew out. And first thing you know, you're going to wind up throwing most of the Bible out. And I believe that the, that the Alma of Isaiah chapter number 7 verse number 14 is the virgin born son of God. Matthew chapter number 1, when he was born of a virgin. All right, now we go through all of that to try to lay a foundation for what, we're gonna, for what I'm going to talk about tonight. I'm going to talk, not Mary, I'm not going to talk about Mary. She is the blessed virgin. She should be honored and respected. She said, from henceforth all people will call me blessed. Right? Is that what the Bible says? How many Baptist preachers have you heard called her blessed? <laughs> you see, here's the problem. The Baptists go too far this way, and the Roman Catholics go way too far that way. They've got her as a co-redemptrix with Christ. They've got Mary as part of your salvation. No, sir, my dear friend. She had nothing to do with your salvation. When the Lord Jesus Christ looked down from the cross, and the women were standing, all the Marys were standing there, and John the Apostle was standing there, the Lord looked at John, and he said, and he, and he looked at Mary and he said, Mary, behold thy son. And that is, of course, a reference to John the Baptist. And not John the Baptist, but John the Apostle, okay? Behold thy son. And the Bible said he took her to his house. He became her, her son in this world. Now let me tell you why that's important. I believe, now you may not agree with me, but you don't have to. But I believe... The Lord Jesus Christ was saying, Mary, I love you. You're my mother. We have a special relationship and have had ever since you've been in this world. But Mary, you need to be born again just like everybody else. And therefore, I am breaking my bonds with you as your son. It is no longer Mary, the mother of Christ. And if you want to talk to Jesus, you've got to go through Mary. No. I am breaking that right now. Mary, you accept John as your son. I'm your Savior. And if you have a problem, this is the problem. We've got to, not just the Catholics, but a lot of others, a lot of the Orthodox and a lot of others, they have Mary elevated to a position far, far above the Bible. Did you know she doesn't show up one time after the book of Acts, chapter number 2? Her name is never mentioned again. And did you know that Joseph, once Christ is born, it doesn't even, it, he's, he's gone. He's gone. He's gone. He's never mentioned again throughout the Bible. Because the focus is not on Mary and it's not on Joseph. The focus is on Christ. Exactly. He is the preeminent one. He is first. He is first. Everything else is subservient to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the issue here. He's the one that matters. He's the one that matters. So, Matthew is talking about the birth of Christ. And he, and, he, and he just stated that nine months, just like all the rest of us, at the end of nine months, she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger. Christ was born with an earthly birth, just like everyone else, except. Now, I want to show you a couple of places. It's very important. Because the reason I do this is because it is so important. Look at Philippians chapter number 2. Philippians chapter number 2. All right. Philippians 2. Look carefully at the wording now. Verse 5. Philippians 2 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, and we're not going to get into that tonight, that's a powerful thing, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now watch this. 
but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. Now watch the wording carefully. Words are important, folks. And was made a man. See, I've, I've done got you where, you where you watch me, and that's good. <laughs> See how quick you caught me? What does it say? Likeness. Now go to Romans chapter number 8. Romans chapter number 8. Verse 3. For what the law could not do, that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of of sinful flesh. Say that word likeness again? He didn't say he sent him in sinful flesh. He didn't come in sinful flesh. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh. <coughs> oh, I'm going to go to Hebrews. Hebrews. I think it's chapter 4. Hebrews 4. Hebrews chapter number 4 and uh, let's see Hebrews chapter number 4 It's in four, somewhere in here. No, that's not it. It's talking about his incarnation. See what happens to Jesus, Son of God, hold fast our profession, and remain faithful in the first place. Jesus. Maybe in another chapter. My mind's got me messed up tonight. Let's see. It's a direct reference to the incarnation. Well, we'll find it. My mind's gone blank. I should have written it down. This is what happened to get old feeble senile bald headed. You can't remember anything. Uh, we'll, somebody. <laughs> we'll, we'll find it. <laughs> It'll come up in a minute. We're now 5-5. Five, five. No, we're not talking about that. We're talking about the incarnation. We're talking about, uh, I can't believe this, for some reason, I just go blank tonight. I've taken to you to that so many times and showed you that scripture. And uh, yes, yes, that's the incarnation. But this has to do with his relationship to humanity, to man. And, uh, and, uh, It'll come up in a minute. We'll find it. We'll go on. I'll go on. And maybe you can keep looking for it. I'll tell you what you might do. Go to Romans 8 and see if there's a cross-reference over there. That's the way you study the Bible. Romans 8. And uh, the uh, likeness of sinful flesh. I don't see a cross-reference in my Bible. And I wasn't taught this when I was uh, first saved. I had to find this, but uh, I can't believe. Anyway, well, it's not. I, 
They were there for the word of God. We were there, man. We okay. It is, brother. Amen. When's the last time you went to prayer meeting and had you hunting all over the Bible trying to find something? Isn't that good? <laughs> all right. I'll find it before this service over tonight, and we'll take you to it, but let's move on. It's, it's in here. Believe me. <laughs> I've read it a thousand times. Uh, maybe in the fifth chapter. Yeah. No, it's not that far. Well, that's talking about what he did. Isn't that amazing? Well, the Bible says he likewise took part of the same. Where is that? Um, 2.14? There it is. Thank you. 2.14. Who said that? Debbie. Give her a star, buddy. <laughs> Hebrews 2.14 For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood this is, the car this is the incarnation now For as much then as children are partakers of flesh and blood He also himself likewise took part of the same See that? See that? Part of the same So what part did he not take? He did not take the curse of Adam Because he didn't have man's blood He had God's blood See? The life of the flesh is in the blood. I've given it to you upon the altar for an atonement for the soul. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. Amen. So I, Romans chapter number 8, Philippians chapter number 2, and Hebrews chapter 2. Debbie's going to help me remember that. Next time we do this, I don't know where to go. I don't know how I got in four. <laughs> chapter number 2 of Hebrews, he likewise took part of the same. That's important, you know that? When the Bible cross-references itself... It doesn't make any mistakes. It doesn't make any mistakes. There was no sin about him and all of that. So the incarnation in Matthew chapter number 1 is what's in view here. And the incarnation has to do with the Davidic kingdom. But it also has to do with the fact that he had to become flesh to die. God cannot die. It is an utter impossibility for God to die. Now that's something that theologians have to sit around and scratch their head over. If Jesus Christ was God, how did he die? See, think about that for a minute. Was he? Absolutely, he was God. But, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. All right? Right? So his spirit went into the hands of the Father. The Bible says in Isaiah, Thou shalt see the travail of his soul and shalt be satisfied. There's the second part. The third part is that his flesh died on the cross at Calvary. Died. And they took him down from the cross because the Bible says when they shoved that spear in his side, he was dead already. So we have his body, his soul, and his spirit, all three that make up the man on the cross at Calvary. His spirit went to the Father. His spirit wasn't dead. His spirit went to the Father. God looked upon his soul. The soul is what happens when the spirit comes into the body. You become a living soul. So his soul at the cross at Calvary was in travail. Then his body died. And then the Bible says he descended into the heart of the earth. That's what happened. And that, of course, is a reference to his soul. And when he went down into the heart of the earth, he went down and he announced what had happened at the cross at Calvary. So Joseph was a just man. And this has to do with Joseph's character. I want you to think about it for a minute. He did not try to take advantage of a situation, which he could have. He could have said, I'm far too good a man to have to put up with something like this. And yet he was willing to believe God, trust God, and, and, uh, and because he did, then he was, uh, he, was, he, was, he was allowed to be blessed and to be in that home and to watch Christ. I've been a thing to watch, watch the God man grow up. Joseph was a carpenter. And I'm sure he taught the trade of carpentry to his son. His stepson, of course. I speak in earthly terms. I'm sure the Lord Jesus Christ knew all about carpentry when he grew up, right? Did you notice? Did you notice that the Lord Jesus Christ was not a shepherd? 
Now he's the good shepherd, chief shepherd, great shepherd. He's all of that, right? But when he was here on this earth, he was a carpenter. What does a carpenter do? They build. Exactly. They build. They build. And the biggest problem with a professor sitting in the colleges and universities in this country, most of them have never built anything. That's a fact. I doubt if Darwin ever built anything in his life. You've got to think to build. It takes some effort to build something. Stuff just doesn't come together and become something. You've got to work at it. You've got to measure. You've got to cut. You've got to figure out what you're doing. Put it together. Build it. You build furniture. You build toys. You build houses. You build all kinds of stuff. You build. Carpenter builds. The Lord Jesus Christ did not come to lead his sheep. He came to die. He's coming back as the shepherd. When he comes the next time, he'll come as the shepherd. The chief shepherd. The great shepherd. He comes back as the shepherd. He comes as the shepherd for the flock. The Lord Jesus Christ will come back as the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, sit on the throne of David in Jerusalem, and He'll reign over the house of Jacob, over the house of Israel. And He'll reign forever. And His sheep will follow Him. So His ministry first time, He came as, he came as a carpenter, worked as a carpenter. Then He went to the cross, and there He died. Joseph's character is what's in view. Notice what the Bible says over here in uh, about this. Look at Luke chapter number 16, verse 10. Luke 16, 10. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in least is unjust also in much. In much. Now that may sound like it's, you know, it's, it's kind of uh, what they call prima facie. In other words, what you're reading here, it should be simple enough to understand it. But there's a lot going on here. And I'm going to tell you why. The little things in life are the things that the, that the egotists overlook. The little things that you put together are the things that the, that the individual who thinks he's too good for that doesn't have time for. But it's the little things in life that if you neglect them and overlook them that have a profound effect on the development of your character. Your character is a very important thing in your relationship with God. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ's character is sterling. There's absolutely no taint in it whatsoever. I've told you before that when He was here 2,000 years ago, he produced a righteousness that did not exist. God is righteous. How many agree with that? God is righteous. The Holy One of Israel is righteous. But we get an understanding of what righteousness is about if we'll watch the life of Christ. We'll begin to understand just exactly what it is. A Pharisee said, Lord, I thank Thee, I'm not as other men. I fast, I tithe, I do all these things. I do all this stuff. The Pharisee saw himself as righteous. We need to understand tonight the definition then of righteous. What does it mean to be righteous? Now the Lord Jesus, the, the Apostle Paul says, I'm not having my own righteousness. I do not have my own righteousness. He said, the righteousness I have is the righteousness which I have by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let's take some... Let's take, some, let's take some points here tonight. For example, is faith an admirable thing? Yes. Without yes. it, you, he that cometh to God must believe that he is. All right. Is, is love an admirable thing? Yes. yes, it is. People are dying for love. All right. Is perseverance an admirable thing? Yes. These are all admirable attributes. But no one of them, no one of them can define the whole person. When you think about righteousness, think about it on these terms. Righteousness is something that it has a broad perspective that defines the whole person. Not just a part of the person, the whole person. Righteousness becomes, therefore, a thing that brings together many, many, many elements. All right? When a man says that he's righteous, he is saying that my faith... My perseverance, 
my love, my relationship with men is right in the sight of God. That's the word righteousness, right standing in the sight of God. But the problem is there is no man walking the face of this earth that is right in every aspect of his life. There are people who are very loyal people. They're very loyal people, but you better not turn your back on them. Because they may be loyal to a cause, loyal to a person, or loyal to something of that nature. But righteousness has to do with the character, the entire character, the complete character of the individual. And this is why the Lord Jesus Christ, when He was here on this earth, every attribute that a perfect man could ever have, regardless of what it could be, when it reached its zenith, in other words, it matured to its greatest point, the Lord Jesus Christ perfected every single part of what a human being could possibly be. Perfect in every sense. Perfect when He was tried. Perfect when He prayed. Perfect when He, when he sorrowed and when He hurt. Perfect when He reached out to other people and bore their burdens. Sinless in every sense of the word. Who can convince me of sin? So therefore, the Lord Jesus Christ was righteous. The righteous one. How many agree with that tonight? The righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, though, is the righteousness that was wrought out and developed over an entire lifetime on this earth. And when he ascended to the right hand of God Almighty in heaven, God opened heaven and allowed the God-man to rise not on the righteousness of the Father, but the righteousness of the Son. <laughs> and that's something. Believe me, that's something. And the righteousness that the Christian has today is not looking at himself and saying, I have developed all, I have perfected all of the, of the great attributes and characteristics of Christianity? No. To his dying day, the Christian will say, the Lord Jesus Christ is my righteousness. He perfected where I failed. He passed where I failed. He is perfect in every sense of the word. And so the Apostle Paul says, not having mine own righteousness, but the righteousness which is by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So righteousness to to the best way to say it is a complete package. Now, take for example the word holy. What does the word holy mean? All right. When they went into Jericho, you remember Jericho? You remember what, what somebody did in Jericho? What did they do? And it cost him his life, his wife, his children. What did they do? Huh? His name was what? Achan. And they did they stoned him to, to death in where? The valley of Achor. And he took a Babylonian garment, wedge of silver, gold. He took that. He hid it in the, in, the, uh, in the tent floor, okay, underneath the dirt. Now, Jericho, according to the Old Testament Scripture, was holy unto the Lord God. Right? That's what it says. It is holy to the Lord God. Kadosh is the Hebrew word. Kadosh Barnea. Holy Barnea. What's that mean? It means it's separate unto God. That's the basic meaning of the word holy. It has nothing to do with being good. It has to do with being separate. The Lord Jesus Christ is holy. God the Father is holy, holy, holy. What's that mean? That means He is apart and separate unto Himself and He needs nothing. We have a holy ghost that lives in us. The Holy Ghost that is in us is not of this world. The Holy Ghost Spirit is not of the spirit of this world. And the fact that He is very, the simple fact that He's in you starts to pull you away from the world. Because He's holy. He's Holy Ghost. Holy Spirit. Hagias Numa. Okay? He pulls you apart away from the world. Therefore, if you have the Holy Ghost living in you, He's going to separate you. He's going to do it unless you grieve Him and quench the Spirit and actively fight against the working of the Holy Ghost in you. He's going to separate you. Because that's what the word means. 
Now, in the process of separation, there's going to be some cleaning up done. There's going to be some sins taken care of. There's going to be some morality involved. Ethics, character, and all these other things are all wonderful. But that's not what holy is. Holy is pulling you apart from and separate unto, from to, from the world to God. Love not the world, the Apostle John says, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Three things, the third is the most deceptive. The flesh is pretty easy to define. Lust of the eyes, pretty easy to define. But the pride of life, that's the one that gets them. That gets them. And the Apostle John says, love not the world. If you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. That's the Holy Ghost. That's the love. That's that attribute of love. That's that greatness of all of that. But it's still holiness. All right? Was the Lord Jesus Christ holy? Absolutely, folks. Holy. Sure he was. Was he sinless? Yes. In every sense of the word, he was sinless. He had all these attributes. But he was righteous. That meant that everything about him Everything about him was in right standing and right before God. Complete. To tell us die. Complete. Finished. Wrapped up. Can't add to it. Can't perfect it. Can't do any more with it. You can't do any more with pure gold. 100%. What is it? What's pure gold? 24 carat? Or is it more than that? Somebody, is that, is that pure? 24 carat? 999. Nine, nine. <laughs> you can't do any more with it. You got pure gold, and of course, gold in the Bible is a is a uh, is a type of, of deity. So righteousness. So what do you do when you take the word like that? Righteous, righteous. When you look at that, you say to yourself, and you know, good night, man. If this is if what this preacher is saying to me tonight is true, for well, my righteousness is a filthy rag, in the son of God. <laughs> right. Now you see how I'm saying it? This is important to get a hold of the concept. I'm not saying what I did. I'm saying what I am. What you do is where religion steps in to clean up what you do. The new birth takes care of who you are. God does not whitewash sepulchers. Taking care of what people do is whitewashing sepulchers. He goes in and changes your nature. And changes you from a child of hell to a child of God. You don't clean from the outside in. You clean from the inside out. He said you're full of dead men's bones. A sepulchre is full of dead men's bones. You whitewash the tombs of the prophets, he said. And said, if it had been in my time, we would have never done such a thing like this. He said, but the blood of righteous, uh, what was it, Zacharias, that was slain by the temple, to be called to your account. This generation, he said, You've got the light that they wish they'd even... He said, if Sodom and Gomorrah had heard the preaching that you've heard, they would have long since repented. But you count it as not. So, Joseph was a just man. And Mary, bless her, bless, blessed Mary, was a believer that accepted, she said, be it so unto thy handmaid, according to thy word. And so it was. She was the mother of the God-man, not the mother of God. Amen. A time of reflection to look back on it. But